sign of summer, isn't it? And it's a sign of a good day in summer. Uh, the, only, the only problem is it could have been better if the seats are all full, right? So, but I'm glad you folks are here and chose to make us a part of your Sunday, and, and we're very grateful for that. Just have a couple of announcements to give to you. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, our missionaries for the month of August, which are you adjusting to August, writing it down? It's hard to do that. Our missions for the month of August are Bob, Lydia, and John. They're serving in Uruguay, and uh, appreciate you keeping them in prayer. You'll be getting more information from the Global Ambassadors Ministry team in the next week or so. Also, this next uh, Sunday is our we'll be having communion, and also our fellowship potluck luncheon. And uh, I, the night we're here. Oh, they're in the nursery today. So be sure to remind them that they're our host for next week. And uh, I think I think you probably know that already. But just encourage you to come, be a part of that. And uh, I'm not sure exactly what's supposed to be brought, but I think uh, at this point it's bring whatever you can and as much as you can, and we'll eat as much as we can. How's that sound? So, but before we do that, we're going to feast upon the Word of God through music, and I invite you to join us in that. Thank you very much. Before we get started with that, I, I thought this wasn't really planned by me well in advance. It just kind of came to me as we were, um, Lisa and I just sang at another church service this morning, just before this. And as we were going through that, I thought... Um, uh, something they did, I thought maybe maybe we could do that, use that this morning. It's just a time of kind of collecting our thoughts and our kind of getting centered and focused. So um, if we could just uh, stand and um, just take maybe 30 seconds or so, and what I would ask you to do in that 30 seconds or so is perhaps just uh, pick one thing that you can pray to God about that He would enable you to. Um, uh, focus on perhaps during this time of worship with uh, with all of us here this morning at St. Thomas United Church. So uh, just take a few seconds and do that right now.
The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How many things can you look on and say, that's marvelous? We use that word so easily and throw it around. I dare say much of what I look at and say, that's marvelous. It's just really, okay. But God is marvelous. Amen. Praise His name. Let's stand upon that truth. I will stand upon your truth.
you've done for us, Lord. Help us to see it truthfully for what it is and not to hear it. It's, it's clouded up with the world.
you from today? Anybody else? Where are you free from? Where are you free from? Free from worry? Ooh. What are you free from? Guilt. Bondage and sin. Anybody else? What are you free from? Work. Work? So, in doing so, Lord, I 
believe our faith will increase, our strength will increase because we're basing it on Christ and not on ourselves. Lord, we thank you and praise you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. This idea of faith is increasing. Let faith rise. Be still, let the Be still. There is a
that we are not just speakers of the truth, that we are doers of the truth, Lord. Help us to have faith. And Lord, as we let that faith arise, Lord, you will give us strength. You will provide. You, yes, love a cheerful giver. Help us to recognize that sometimes that giving, whether it's in money or in time or in our skills or our gifts, that sometimes that's a sacrifice that we don't always see that we have the time or the energy or the finances. But Lord, when we give them to your kingdom, you will make a way. Your love is amazing. Your faithfulness is amazing. Your grace is amazing. And we say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
like to come up.
and you can see some people that are extremely high because they were sure at the end of that needle or within that cigarette, which wasn't really a cigarette. Truth was there someplace. They look for it in various religions. They look for it in drugs and drink. They chase after it in parties and bills. They still don't find it. Francis Schaeffer describes it this way, quote, People imagined that by denying the existence of absolute truth and by throwing off the shackles of biblical morality, they would finally be set free. Instead, they found themselves only more empty and enslaved to destructive passions. Francis Schaeffer's been dead for many years, but wouldn't you say that's a pretty accurate picture of our culture, our world today? It's almost as if there is a treasure that everyone knows about this treasure, but nobody knows where it is, and they're out looking for it without a treasure map, without a compass. So, what does it have to do with us? For those who are followers of Jesus Christ, you and I must help people experience freedom. Remember the 21 Eskimo we talked about last time? It was always my goal was the guy that was speedy with reading to go and free as many people as I possibly could without getting caught. We ought to have that same spiritual adrenaline rush to go around freeing up as many people as possible that are in bondage. And that can only happen when they discover the truth. It's not what, it's who. It's Jesus Christ. You and I know this stuff, don't we? But I think we forget and try to provide all kinds of formulas and suggestions. People simply need Jesus. We're going to be looking today at three different parts in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. <coughs> And if you would like, in your imagination, you could develop a Scooby-Doo voice. We'll be looking at real freedom. Okay, who's got the Scooby-Doo voice? There you go. All right. Wrong freedom. And feel free to spell that with an R, if you really want to spell it phonetically. And then results of freedom. We're going to be looking at real freedom. Wrong freedom and the results of freedom. Let's look at verses 31 and 32. Do you have in your bulletin an outline there? No. They were printed, but evidently they didn't get any further than that. Make it up. But do it right down the right stuff, okay? There's some space on your bulletin. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Last time we were talking about how to avoid getting into heaven, right? There's various ways of how to avoid getting into heaven. But then at the very end, John wrote that very unique comment where he says, Many of them believed in him. Many of those that were there believed in him. Now in this section, Jesus begins by speaking specifically to this group who had chosen to believe in him. And from the context, it seems to appear that their belief was not yet a saving belief. Okay? And if you understand that from the get-go, then you'll understand why he says what he says as we're going through this here. Leon Morris explains it this way. This is a most dangerous spiritual state. To recognize that truth is in Jesus and to do nothing about it means that, in effect, one aligns oneself with the enemies of the Lord. You can know the facts, but not really know the Savior. You can know the facts, but still not be free. It's as if Jesus is saying to them that if their belief is genuine, then they will do what he says to do. He says, if you continue in my word, 
then you are truly disciples of mine. It's not a if you do this, then this will happen. It's if this is the case, here's what we're going to see. You understand the difference? Their idea of if you continue my word, and there's many that have taught this, if you continue my word, that will get you saved. Folks, that won't get you saved. But if you're saved, you're going to continue in my word. Because there's too many that says, okay, just tell me what to do. Tell me what the Bible says and I'll do it, right? We know people like that. We used to be people like that, some of us. Part of the problem is that people want eternal life. But they believe it's completely possible to live the way they've always lived. And yet you never see that presented as an option in Scripture. It's what John MacArthur and others call easy believism. I use that phrase many times. It's just, just accept Jesus and everything's okay. You don't have to change. If you just accept Jesus, you're going to change. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will change. You don't want to stay the way you used to be. You're going to want to be a different person. It's interesting as you look through Scripture... It's obvious that not all faith, not all belief, is saving faith or saving belief. If a person is truly born again, they'll live according to the ways of Jesus. We'll want to do that which pleases God. We will not want to be the same old person with a different destination. It can't happen. If you've got a different destination, if your destination is heaven, you're not going to be the same old person. It's impossible. Some people believe, but they're afraid to go on to the next step of total surrender because they're afraid of what it might do to them. They may be rejected by some. They may lose their jobs. They may be considered to be dead to other family members. Interestingly, the Bible tells us in the book of James that even the devil and the demons believe, and they tremble. You and I know they're not going to be in heaven. They just know the facts. Theologically, faith or belief has three basic parts to it. You've probably heard this before. The first aspect is that of knowledge. Okay? Knowledge, very simply, it's a recognition of the facts and the information about salvation in Christ. Many of us were at this point in some time in our lives. There are some of you here that had the knowledge. Some of you know more about the Bible than I do. But you wouldn't take it any farther than just knowledge. The second part is that of assent. It goes beyond knowledge, and it not only recognizes the information, the facts about salvation in Christ, it's in agreement. It acknowledges and assents to the fact that this is all true. This information is all true. Everything that the Bible says is proven. It's true. I understand it's valid. That's still not saving faith. The third part is trust. So the first part, you simply have the knowledge. You've got the information. The second part, he says, you can't argue with it. I can't deny it. It's true. The third part says, whoa, because of all of this, I'm going to make the commitment. I'm going to confess my sins. I'm going to repent because I don't want to go that way any longer. And I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus Christ because I know he's the only way to salvation. There's a lot of religious people that are in the first two areas of knowledge and assent. There's not that many that are willing to go on to trust but you'll never be free until you trust. We were talking in Sunday school about the way the world is going today and how the end seems closer than ever before. And the gist of that is we need to be busy. God is putting people in our lives that we need to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. God is putting people in our paths where we need to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 23, yes, to do, whatever it is. 
In other words, you share the plan of Jesus Christ with them. You share the good news of the gospel with them. Because if you don't, who will? The people that you meet are not accidental. It's not coincidence. It's God's plan, God's purpose. Now those of us who have gone so far as to trust, Jesus gives information that will prove whether or not we've truly done this. This is not a formula to get saved. It's the evidence that we truly are saved. The word are, even in the English, but in the Greek specifically, it's in the present tense. It's not suggesting that if you're obedient to God's word, then you will become future disciples of Jesus. He's saying you are. If you do this, then you are. Because you and I know we can't do this unless we are saved. We can't follow the commands of Jesus unless we are saved. Jesus reminds the people that as they continue to follow him and live according to the word, they'll know the truth. Isn't it amazing the things that we wouldn't just understand at all about life and about scripture until we knew Jesus? That's because the Holy Spirit illumines and brings to mind and helps us to have understanding in his word. He helps us to be able to deal with this world with an eternal perspective. Truly, I can see clearly now. Right? The song. We can't without Jesus. The Faith Life Study Bible has a footnote about this. It says, likely, the word here, likely invoking the Old Testament concept of truth refers to a dependable foundation for building a way of life. If you're following him, you'll know the truth. You'll know what is needed to have a life that is pleasing to Jesus Christ. And that truth, no matter what comes against it, will indeed set people free. You could be like Paul. You could be like Peter. You could be imprisoned, shackles about you, tortured, but you could be free. But only if you know Jesus. Only if you know Jesus. No longer will we be in bondage to the world's thinking or any form of sin. When a person is set free, they are no longer needing to listen to Satan's lies and respond out of fear. No longer will you and I be fearful of the upcoming judgment. When I share with people sometimes that I don't know very well, I will ask them, for example, if they're dying, I will literally tell them, you know you're dying, right? You know you're not going to be on this planet much longer, right? Yeah, I know that. Tell me, what happens after you die? Where will you be? You know what the number one response is? Hopefully, in heaven. That just breaks my heart when I hear that. But that lets me know, hey, i got more talking to do. <laughs> do you want to know how you can know for sure that you're going to wake up in heaven? And you can present the gospel plan to Folks, there's no hope fully that I'll be in heaven. I know I'm going to be in heaven. I know. We lost a very dear friend in Chicago. He was a senior pastor in whom I served. Not only is he a relative, but he was my mentor. One of the most godly men we never hoped to be. He and his wife were like parents to us. My wife and I wanted so much to go back to the funeral, but as we're talking and visiting, it seemed like the Spirit of God was working in her much more than me. Because I wanted to go. I wanted to honor the family. I wanted to be there for the church family that was there that caused us to stay in pastoral ministry. And my wife says, honey, he's already in heaven. Our being there won't change anything. It won't change anything. So I'm good with that. And so we're going to send <coughs> some Gideon Bibles there in his memory because he was so concerned about people's souls. We should have that same intensity of concern for the salvation of others. 
We should be so connected with God's Word that people don't have to guess to whom we belong. As he was dying, he shared Psalm 27. Our dear friends Paul and Deanne went to minister to him and to love on him. They're also very close to us. And they said, before we went, he says, let me pray with you. He's in the hospital bed in the living room, dying. And then he shares Psalm 27 and prays with him that God would use them. He didn't have to say, I sure hope I get to heaven. He knew. He knew. You and I, we've been set free. We know. But there's a world around us, friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, that don't know. And we are charged with the responsibility to do everything we possibly can to help set them free. We can't do it by ourselves. The Holy Spirit does it, but He uses us. He uses us. Secondly, sadly, there's a wrong freedom. Verses 33 and 34, they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. <laughs> oh my, how is it that you say, you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. Evidently, Jesus had just taken them a step further than they were ready to go. They were stuck on knowledge. They, some of them may have been on ascent, but none of them were ready to commit. They understood the fact that Jesus was God, but when Jesus talks about them being set free, that raised some serious questions in their mind. So you see this bewildered question and comment here, which really amounts to a rejection in what Jesus is offering them. They were rejecting that in favor of their tradition and their heritage. Now, if we just look at this from a physical perspective, which I think we can, because we've seen time and time again that the Jewish people seem to be stuck in the physical world, didn't they? Not unlike many of us. But just look at this from a physical perspective. You know, we complain about the United States leadership doesn't know their history, and most of its citizenry doesn't know the history of the world. These guys didn't even know their own history. You know, you're probably thinking, wow, are they wrong? Because we're in Sunday school class, and we're talking about the Hebrews being enslaved in Egypt, right? Okay, there's one. Well, then you've got, in 721 B.C., the Northern Kingdom enslaved. And we're not even doing the Book of Judges, folks. There's at least 10 to 12 times there. Assyria comes and takes them over. Then 586 B.C. You've got Babylon coming to take over the southern kingdom. Totally loots and ransacks the temple, destroys it. 70 years of captivity. Oh, and where are they right now? They're under Roman oppression. Oh, we've never been enslaved anyone. But notice Jesus doesn't give them a history lesson, does he? History is irrelevant when it comes to your eternal soul. Jesus is focused on their souls. He's focused on their souls. It's the spiritual slavery which Jesus is addressing. And interestingly, the physical enslavement was because of their spiritual slavery to false gods. It's because of their disobedience to God. Even now, the excessive rules and regulations and unbiblical practices were a form of spiritual bondage. It's not too different than many people today, is it? Although many are not under bondage personally to some obvious and blatant sin, the majority of people don't realize that they're still enslaved and in bondage to sin in all kinds of ways. That's 
what Jesus is describing when he says they're slaves to sin because they sin. You might think, well, that's a captain obvious, isn't it? Because Jesus is getting right to the core of the issues. And so as I, as I think about this, I think, you know, we spend a lot of time in evangelicalism, those of us who are true followers of Jesus Christ, we spend a lot of unnecessary time pointing out error in other people's thinking. Now, biblically, we point out error for those who claim to be Christians. That biblically we're told to do. But those who are not saved, don't waste your time trying to correct they're wrong-headed thinking. <laughs> Present to them Jesus. Present to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because their logic is perfectly normal because they're serving the father of all liars. So don't waste your time on that. The unsaved need to hear about Jesus. They don't need a history lesson. They don't need a science lesson. They don't need a socialist lesson. They need to be told about the love of Jesus Christ. And that he can set them free. Very simply, Jesus states, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. This is incredibly important, the wording in here. Jesus uses the present tense, commits. He doesn't say everyone who committed sin. He said everyone who commits sin. It's a lifestyle. It's not simply individual actions against God because that kind of blows it if you're saying, well, I didn't do this or this or this. He's talking about a lifestyle, a mentality, a want to to do those things that are displeasing to God. It's our very nature. And they thought their connection with Abraham and all their ethnic claims to the promises guaranteed them a spot in heaven. And Jesus points out the reality. They were delusional in their hope for heaven. Because unless a person follows Jesus Christ only, then that person is still enslaved to their sin. And only when that happens does a person experience real freedom when they surrender themselves to Jesus. Because everything else is an illusion. It's a false or a wrong freedom. Finally, verses 35 and 36, we see the result of freedom. It says, a slave does not remain in the house forever. The Son does remain forever. So, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. It's an interesting comment which Jesus makes here. Because if you remember the Old Testament system, you could be enslaved to someone, but it wasn't forever. It was six years. <clears throat> Seventh year, you were set free. But you didn't get to stay in the house. It's not yours. You go back to your property, to your home, whatever, or you go out and make, make a new life for yourself. However, the son has all the rights of the dad in the house. That house is going to be his. The son gets to stay there. It's his. And he's fixing it up for the people he's going to have over later on. Because dad said he could. And if the son says to the slave, I set you free, come and live with me. You are free indeed. Did you know that we inherit what Jesus inherits? I don't get that. But that's what the Bible says. We are children of God, but we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We are joint heirs with Him. How could that be? Because we're no longer slaves. We've been set free. The slave did not inherit anything. Not that man. If you find yourself a slave of sin, there is an inheritance. Hell is eternal torment. It's torture forever and ever. And no, you will not be a charcoal forget. You will experience it forever if you don't know Jesus Christ. Think about that, brother and sister. When you think of your family members who are unsaved. 
when you think of your friends who are unsaved. Our time is short on this planet. I'm not a prophet, nor am I a son of a prophet. But the Bible seems to be very clear. All these things that are coming into place seem to be pointing at the time of the Lord's return is very near when He takes His church off this planet. In the meantime, you and I need to be busy, don't we? There's a hymn written by John Wesley. We sang it at Moody Bibles and it frequently, as well as many churches over the years. And it, it stirs me very deeply. And that hymn came to mind as I went through this passage, And Can It Be? And Can It Be? He says in this one verse, Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light, my chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. We are set free, brothers and sisters. We ought to have joy marking everything about us. We ought to walk and talk and live in such a way the world sees Christ in us. As we look clear back at the life of Moses when he came down from the mount from being in the very presence of God, the people could not look upon his face because of the radiance. When people look at us, do they see Christ in such a way that they say, I have got to have what you have? Or are they so hardened that they just can't look at you? Because you remind them of their sin. You remind them of their hopelessness. Can I say that's a good thing? Because you have the answer to the hopelessness, don't you? He's found in Jesus. We just present to Christ. Let the Holy Spirit do His work. You know, there's a, there's a very big difference between being Abraham's children physically and Abraham's children spiritually. There's a huge, huge difference between going to church and being a part of Christ's church. It's the difference between heaven and hell. How do you understand truth? If you believe that Jesus is the truth, then make sure, be certain that you've moved beyond mental understanding. Make sure that you believe in such a way that you're willing to surrender yourself to the absolute Lordship of Jesus Christ. He is the only Lord. He is the only Savior. And then let Him set you free from everything that drags you down and takes you away from God. Let Jesus set you free to serve Him, follow Him, and live for Him always. And if you're free, then continue in the Word and help others to experience that freedom. I don't know anybody's hearts in here. Only God knows your heart. I don't get a sneak preview into the Lamb's Book of Life. Even the angels didn't. John didn't, because there's only one worthy of what we have. Are you one who just goes to church, or are you part of Christ's church? And if you are part of Christ's church, praise be to God. You're free. You're free. But we're also slaves to Jesus. We're called upon to be his ambassadors, to tell others, to impact as many people for the cause of Jesus Christ as is possible. And you don't do it on your own. Thank the Lord for that, right? You do it with the power of the Holy Spirit in you. And you leave the results to God. You're going to be rejected many times. And yeah, it hurts. But it shouldn't hurt because they turned me down. It hurts because they turned Jesus down. 
that's where the pain should be. You know, my ego is not built upon that. Yours shouldn't be either. Well done, good and faithful servant. I'm convinced that it's not so much what we do in good works. I'm convinced it's all about obedience to what God calls us to do. And the number one thing he's called the church to do is to go and to make disciples. That's the number one thing he's called the church to do. All the other stuff is peripheral. It really is. All the other stuff makes no difference in eternity. We've been called to go out and make disciples. We were talking at Sunday school on one church. There's a sign above the door as you go out. Basically, it's this. You are now entering a war zone. Be sure you cut your arm off. Okay? And in that section of Ephesians 6, it says, in the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit. All this is done. I can put all that armor on and I can look good. But unless it's the Spirit of God helping me to utilize it, I'm just like that one guy just swinging the sword back and forth, hoping I hit something. Some of you got that picture already in your mind. Let's, okay. Let's stand as we pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you so much for your incredible love. That you will not let us go. As the song says, oh love that will not let me go. You keep after us. As Whitfield said, as the hound of heaven. Pursuing us. Till we get to that point where we surrender ourselves to you. And Father, for all of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, help us to look at the opportunities that you place in front of us and to be obedient and share the love of Christ. Help us to be always mindful of the fact that every single thing that we do, we do it for the glory of God. It's not about our job. It's not about us. Everything we do is for the glory of God. Whether it's teaching, pounding nails, healing wounds, cutting grass, cooking meals, washing dishes, cleaning toilets. We do it for the glory of God. That others would see Christ in us. And I know where that sounds strange to many ears, but that is oftentimes how others see Christ. is in just the everyday, mundane activities of life. Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, that has questions in their mind about if I were to die today, where would I be? Father, cause them to stay back and to visit with someone here. To be certain that they know where their eternal destiny will be. Father, we love you. We cannot imagine the love you have for us and that you would sin your son, to willingly lay his life down for us so that we would have the righteousness of God. It's all through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.